Good afternoon. My name is Michael Lonergan, and I am the producing director here at New York Live Arts. Today, we begin our fifth and final day of the Live Ideas Festival. And the Live Ideas Festival comes to us out of the vision of our executive artistic director, Bill T. Jones, and curator, Lawrence Weschler. What they've brought to us is the vast and very worlds of Dr. Oliver Sacks. And if any of you have had the opportunity to spend any time with us this week, I'm sure you would agree at just what an amazing reach Mr. Sacks' work, writing, and mind has on all of us. Throughout the week, we've explored everything from music, film, dance, theater, and all through the lens of our now good friend, Oliver. I think Probably what's been one of the more interesting parts of this week's festival have been moments where we can engage in dialogues through panels such as this. And this afternoon is no different. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce now the moderator of that panel, a good friend of the festival, Janice Rimler. Thank you. Testing. to a convention where everybody there has Tourette's, or taking us back in time to Martha's Vineyard when there was an era where everybody in Martha's Vineyard used sign language, whether they were deaf or hearing. And all that Oliver portrays, there's an overriding sense of community, communication, and commitment. And this is vividly illustrated in Seeing Voices, or Journey into the World of the Deaf. This was published in August of 1989. It was Oliver's fifth book, and he covered an array of topics which really guides us in our discussion today. He talks about deaf studies. He talked about sign languages being full-bodied, linguistically correct, syntactically correct languages. He talked, of course, about the neurology of deafness. And he talked about the history of Americans who are deaf in this country and the challenges that the deaf community has faced socially and linguistically. A pivotal point in 
modern day deaf history was the 1988 Gallaudet uprising, student uprising, where the students wanted to have a deaf president. Now for those of you who don't know, Gallaudet University is the only four-year liberal arts college in the world for deaf students. <coughs> Oliver rushed down to see it for his own eyes and the students prevailed and they got what they wanted and deserved, a deaf president. This is our backdrop. Which is fantastic, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we begin. So right now, you're not gonna hear my voice anymore. You're going to hear an interpreter's voice because I need to change my hands into action. So my first question is, where are you from? And who introduced you to American Sign Language? Anyone? <laughs> should we go in order or? I think we should just jump in. I'll begin. I was born in Chicago. Yeah, Chicago. During the blizzard year. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what <laughs> age I am, but that's another story. So I was 21, born. 21, right? Uh, <laughs> I was born into a deaf family. Five generations of deaf people in my family. And sign language was very natural for me, and it was natural in my family. My mother was born in Mexico and went, came to Texas, eventually went to the Texas School for the Deaf, and that's how she learned American Sign Language at the Texas School for the Deaf. She finished school in eighth grade, and I have deaf siblings as well. Anyway, we ended up in Chicago. I was born in Chicago. And signing was a natural part of our life. And one day, as I was in the grocery store, it struck me because I looked at all the people whose mouths were moving. And it was puzzling to me. And that's when I realized that we were the only ones signing in that store. Because I had previously thought the entire world was deaf. And I found out to my surprise that it was not. And I suddenly felt my world become very small. And the amount of people moving their mouths became very large. And that was when I realized that I was deaf. And that was when I realized that ASL was different. Well, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, third generation of deaf families. Uh, and. We don't know if anybody was deaf before those three generations. Uh, there, there are no records about that. Uh, I went to a deaf school. Uh, but it was an in, an in an oral program where they taught us speech and lip reading. But I was, I was brought up fully bilingual in ASL and English just because of my family, not because of the school. I have a similar experience. I'm second generation deaf from Chicago two generations of ASL. My, I'm sorry, first generation ASL user. My parents grew up in an oral school. I have an older sister who's deaf, two, two older sisters, all first generation ASL users. When my grandfather, when, when my, sister. my sister was born, my parents demanded that she speak first. They knew that she was, that she was deaf, but they felt like they felt threatened that the grandfather was trying to force her to sign. So she learned to speak first and then s use ASL second. So we simcommed at home, and then when the hearing people weren't around, we signed. So we used both English and ASL at home. Well, I'm in a very different situation in that um, I grew up old. I grew up assuming that, that every adult I saw was hearing that by the time I grew up, I was going to be hearing. Yeah, you know, you just assume it. Um, I thought that audiology tests were like a game. You raised your hand. I, you, you know, you see the somebody pressing the button, and you raise your hand. And then they made me face the wall, and I couldn't play the game anymore. Um, but and then, so I, my parents were taught, and most parents are taught that the worst thing that they could do for the deaf child is to teach them a language, a visual language. My parents were told that if I learned to use sign language, I was never going to talk. And for hearing parents, they wanted to bond with me. That terrified them. 
So uh, I grew up basically communicating with my family, which was the language which I consider my first language and I'm the most comfortable with in the world, is writing. I would write back and forth. I, would, I went to classes, but I never really participated. I sat in the back and I got into fights with my math teachers all the time by putting a book behind and reading. So I really relate to Dr. Sachs simply because the way that I I've learned the world, the way that I learned about sex, the way that I learned about everything, were through books, not through people. And I was incredibly isolated. I was so incredibly isolated. I graduated from a fine four-year university without ever going to a college, for really without ever going to a class for four years. I just copied people's notes. And I graduated near the top of my department, but then I wasn't accepted in graduate school anyplace because what would you do as an old deaf person? I mean, I graduated from college not to say how old I am, before there was a TTY, before there were personal computer, before there were personal computers, before there was any way that you could really communicate. And I was so isolated. So I landed up unemployed, and this is how I learned sign language. I got hired to work at a deaf school. And then the first oh, I, thought I, I was uh, living, I was told I was going to live with 10 little boys in a, in a dorm, and I was going to take care of them. And I was going to be a coordinator between the school and the dorm. So I walk in, and the first thing that happens is these little boys start running away. So I said, OK, you guys, teach me. Teach me the sign for stop. So they taught me the sign for star. And then the kids kept running. And then the kids kept running. And I said, OK, OK, well, you teach me the sign for punish. So star, punish. And then I went forward. But from the first day, there was something that I really understood. You know what it was? There was something really terribly wrong here. I am a 20-year-old, 21-year-old young woman. And I'm living with these little boys that need to learn a language. And I can't communicate their language. And they're expecting me to teach them English. Is there something wrong here? Don't these kids deserve something more? And Teresa, that is so interesting because that comment leads us to our next question. I was wanting to know about your educational experiences and how they led you to your options for the future, to college, to graduate school. And I'm also wondering if things have changed over the years. Well, for me, it's interesting you're talking about hearing parents' point of view and, what, and their, their view of having a deaf child. And we were talking about deaf parents and signing in the family. For generations, we didn't feel a real pride in our deaf culture and our deaf language. We were embarrassed in the majority culture. And the fact that I was hard of hearing meant led, led my parents to put me in, a hear, in an oral program, in a hearing school. I had to sit in front of the class, watch the teacher, try to lip read, sit close to her, but when her back was turned to me, I couldn't understand what was going on, so I was keyed into the class in and out, in and out. And I felt a little bit negative about deaf culture. I learned that lesson actually from my parents who were deaf. So I interiorized that kind of negative attitude about deafness. College was really the first time that I dove into the deaf world. It was at CSUN, California State University at Northridge in California. And I felt like that was my home, really. I started putting down roots. I understood who I was. That my heart was really in the deaf world, not in the majority world. So that's my educational background. I grew up mainstreamed. Uh, in kindergarten, I was in a deaf program and then placed into a mainstream program with an interpreter. I graduated from the eighth grade and transferred to MSSD the model secondary school for the deaf on the Gallaudet campus. My older sister had been a student there as well. And that was my first deaf school, a place where everyone was the same as I, which was an odd experience, ironic at the time, because I grew up in more of a hearing dominant culture and I had deaf friends, but to really live among deaf people, that experience had been limited. But MSSD opened up a new life for me. It was a 24 seven deaf life. And 
I learned to sign, I socialized with deaf people, and that's where I began to feel more deaf pride, and that was at MSSD. I went back to Chicago for college. I was in one of the top programs, acting programs in the country. I went into that program, and I felt even better about myself because I thought, I'm gonna teach them about deaf culture. I had interpreters in my classes, I had teachers who were very supportive, I had classmates who were supportive. Some, I had teachers who tried to learn sign, I exposed them to ASL and deaf culture, I exposed them to theater of the deaf, I was able to teach them. But it was MSSD when I began to feel pride in myself as a deaf person. And I think for me growing up, my parents worked uh, selling cards that had the letters of the alphabet written on them. The card said things like, I am a deaf mute. And then they had the letters of the alphabet with fingerspelling images on them. And they were trying to sell cards to move living. And we moved about a great deal. I went to 13 different schools. And my mother felt that hearing people always knew better than deaf people. And so she would abide by whatever they said. If they told her to move to a certain area and they told me to be in an oral program, I was placed in an oral program with no sign language. And that was terrible for me because I got punished all the time. So I got my hand slapped. I got to, uh, put out in the hallway because I couldn't help it. I was just signing. <laughs> That's what I was doing. I was using my language. There I was signing away. My hands were slapped. And then I was punished repeatedly. And one time I was seated in the hall, and there was my brother, also <laughs> seated in the hall. And I thought, my goodness. So we moved about to many different schools, and I think I was at three different schools for the deaf. I was also in mainstream programs with deaf and hearing kids. In my last three years, I also went to the model secondary school for the deaf, just like you did, Aaron. Yeah, all right. Yes, alumni, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I came in as a sophomore, and that was when I actually finally understood. And by that time, I was already 16. Then I understood what my hands were doing. I said, aha, that's actually American Sign Language. I learned it from my drama teacher, Malskun, Eric Malskun, everybody knows him. He's a famous performance teacher in the deaf world. I bless him. He taught me the artistry of my hands. He taught me the artistry of my language that ASL and English were different. I had deaf English teachers teaching me about English through my language of ASL. And that was the first time I actually understood. And that's when I fell in love with English. I fell in love with reading. I had never had books in my house. We were too poor to own any. We never had any books in our home. And I started reading, and I couldn't stop. I read nursery rhymes. I read everything. And that started when I was 16 or 17 years old. So they taught me an awful lot. And then after I graduated from high school, I continued to teach myself English. But I wanted to learn more about, how can I put it? About my deaf identity as an adult. And now I am a mother of two deaf children. And my children make me look at education constantly, education of the deaf constantly. Now to that point, has education for the ch deaf children changed since, since you were originally in school? You're talking about identity awareness. Has there been any changes in identity awareness for education since your time at school? I would say it's no different. No different. American Sign Language is still not accepted, and I am severely disappointed because Oliver Sacks wrote his book, Seeing Voices, so long ago, 1989, right? Right, it was 89. That was published in 1989. It is 2013 now. And after his book was published, 1991, they started having newborn hearing screenings under EHDI, Early Hearing Detection and Intervention uh, Initiatives. So EHDI in 1991, they said any newborn child has to be screened for a hearing loss. It became almost like a factory. We were looking for deaf babies in hospitals, capturing them quickly, and sending them immediately to audio, audiologists and, and audio therapy. But we didn't do a language screening. If we had waited for a 
three to six month follow up in California, we do have that. We say that there is the lowest loss to catch up, which means that we're, we're chasing after the deaf babies very well and we are identifying their hearing loss as early as possible, and yet over 92% of these deaf children that have been identified are not reading at an age-appropriate level. And they are going into kindergarten, and they don't know their colors, and they don't know their numbers, and they don't know their name, and that is still happening today with deaf children. So what is wrong with this picture? Well, yeah, to add, I mean, I was very disappointed that of the many, many schools for the deaf who have closed down through the years that transitioned into special needs schools for children who are autistic or those with developmental delays or multiple disabilities. The schools that were there for children who are deaf closed down and the ones that remained became strongly um, referring to cochlear implants. And so I think that has a lot to do with deaf identity and deaf pride because we see a lot less of, uh, many fewer of those places. And it seems like we've been kicked back in history again. And the great irony of all of this is once they got early diagnostic tools for identifying deaf babies, when they could have been given sign language and a normal development, they weren't. Uh, and, and even a worse irony is that they're starting to teach sign language to hearing babies, not deaf babies, so that they right, can right. eliminate the frustrations of not being able to uh, communicate with hearing babies, and yet deaf babies are not allowed to sign. Why is that? That's a great irony. There's something really wrong with the picture. Uh, Dr. Lorraine Petito, too, she's a world-leading scientist and neuroscientist and works in the field of deaf babies' brains and visual uh, processing. She says that the human brain does not discriminate whether it is oral or visual communication. It's just that the people are discriminating. So how did that happen? Research also shows that sign language does help children learn speech because they can actually understand what is finally being expected of them and know what they're supposed to do with their mouth. And that they know they can be told clearly in their own language where they're supposed to put their tongue, et cetera. And then the, Absolutely I'm from right. a deaf family. My sister and I, are, I could speak, but my sister speaks so beautifully and I don't speak as well as she does. So how is that possible? because I had uh, less exposure. We both did. We both had n less exposure to a, 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 an auditory environment because there were deaf parents in the household, so, but she speaks beautifully. So the medical profession really needs to change its perspective. And society, I think, needs to be outraged, <laughs> whatever term the interpreter wants to say, but I think we need to be <coughs> defiantly uh, protesting and saying that deaf children have the right to access both languages, visual and sign language, as well as auditory. We can probably get more sound from them if they can speak great, but we need, it's far more important that they need to be able to sign, which will lead exactly. to their literacy, read to them reading and writing, and lead it's to them having interaction. It's more important to be human. To be human. Absolutely. What makes us human is our ability to communicate and our ability to have a language. And when, when Terry Lee was talking about the 92% of the deaf kids that are behind when they start primary school, they're not just talking about sign language deaf, they're talking about the kids with cochlear implants too. Why? Why? And why? What is wrong with having the right to be part of a group? Because, you know, I have a cochlear implant because basically what happened was kind of like a silly story was that I, after I learned sign language and was in the deaf community for three to four years, I decided to go back to law school and I could not deal with being back in the isolation of the hearing world. Now, at that time I was dealing, I was dating a hearing man who became deaf, got a cochlear implant, and the doctors really wanted me. I was a bright deaf woman and they wanted me and I got a cochlear implant. So my world went in two ways. I was at NYU for, where for the first time in my life, I had sign language interpreters in all my classes, and my God, was school so much easier. I didn't study at all. 
I could just go to class and just have fun. And then uh, at the same time, oh my God, the guy in the neighborhood deli was looking at me. He said, I knew you were faking it because I can understand you. I could never understand you before and I can understand you now. How come? Lady, I knew you were faking it. You're all, that, all those years you made me write on paper, you were faking it because my voice improved. And all of a sudden, hearing people could understand me, they could understand my voice. Well, big deal, you can understand my voice. Why should I have to get a metal box to put in my head so you can understand my voice? Why should I, I mean, really, honestly, and it, to frankly, honestly, it does not make any difference at all in terms of being a social human being to me, because sure, one-on-one, -on -one, an implant is very, very helpful. But you know, these guys got hearing aids and the implant, frankly, is not any that much different. I remember talking about my implant with my hard of hearing friends, it doesn't make any difference. And then you can never in a group, and in I, a group situation, a cochlear implant, in my opinion, doesn't work. It really doesn't work. So, so Teresa, if I want to be a social, yeah. I'm, I'm not just thinking that cochlear implants or hearing aid is no. the issue. Language I think is that language driving. deprivation it's is the issue. The issue. Yes, exactly. That is a form of child abuse. And I don't care if they're wearing hearing aids, a cochlear implant, whatever they do is fine. That's your business. It's your body. It's my body. Fine. But the point is access to language. Language is a human right. And we are permitting children to be denied access to language because the adults want the children to look and speak and act like hearing people, and that is discrimination. So I want everybody to wake up. It is discrimination, and it is oppressive. It's oppression. Right, absolutely. And I do have to say that I am very grateful to my two children, Gianni and Kathleen, because my first son, I was in love with signing with him, and we shared sign language back and forth. And then when my daughter was born, it woke me up <laughs> because I realized that uh, I had, in the span of all those years, nothing had changed. And that's what hit me. And I said, this is just not fair. I am imparting my language to my children. I am giving them language access bilingually, both English in signing and reading, uh, English in in reading and signing in ASL. So they're being exposed to both language. I'm giving them as much opportunity to have exposure to language as possible, to have access, whether it's sign, auditory, visual, and their father is hearing. So they're getting, their, their exposure runs the gamut. But then people are saying to me, my gosh, your son speaks beautifully. How did you do that? And I'm thinking, no one ever asked me how my son signs so beautifully. That's a question I never get. But my son does sign beautifully, and he writes beautifully, and he speaks fine. <laughs> so I feel that I want to provide language access for all deaf babies. I personally feel responsible, and I hope we all will join in, that we need to be accountable and make sure that deaf children have bilingual access. And that's why I have decided to create the Claire's Children in Foundation. And we are empowering parents to discard what the doctors, the audiologists are saying, and ask them to look at us as people who understand what it is like to be deaf. Let us help the parents with deaf children. Now, I'm a deaf person. I'm not using my voice. Lewis is deaf. He speaks and signs musically. Teresa speaks beautifully. She writes incredibly. <laughs> I have to say her signing is a little so-so. But that's not your fault. <laughs> not your fault. <laughs> so my goal here is for all of us, if deaf children thinks that uh, they can speak beautifully, why not let them sign beautifully as well? Why not let them learn ASL you know, from you? I was deprived of the opportunity to teach my kids ASL as a baby because as a parent, I didn't know how to sign well enough to really teach them an advanced form of ASL. 
I know. I know. I know. And that's an awful thing. And that's thing. also not your people parents' fault. People say, well, fault. why don't you teach your kids how to sign? And I said, my sign language is fine. Look, I can sign in English all day and all night. I can sign in English fine. But signing in English is kind of boring. It's, it's not a real language. And I wasn't going to bring up my babies that way. Right. That's true. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that Claire's Children is an e-learning website to empower deaf children, provide access for them to language at an early age so that by the time they're in kindergarten, they're ready. And it also is there to empower parents to learn how to create the LRE. And we're not talking about the least restrictive environment. Rather, we're talking about a language-rich environment and how to empower the families, how to you incorporate ASL and English and sound. Sure. Why not have them all visual and auditory? And that is what Oliver wrote in his book. He was talking about the spatial power. And when I read that, I got chills. Yeah, it's, it, it is chill invoking, definitely. And we know that Oliver is unique. So how do you convince the medical profession to understand that? Well, I think what's happening currently that, uh, that we as a community must own our, uh, our power, our visual power, not to think all, all the time about hearing loss and what the medical profession has said about us. In the past few years, we've started talking about what we call deaf gain instead of hearing loss. There are many things that where we have a lot to offer more than hearing people. In architecture, for example, creating buildings where people can see each other more easily. Uh, in the area of science and computer work, uh, there are a lot of things that we can help hearing people develop a better visual sense, spatial sense of the world. We need to own that, and then we can contribute to the hearing world. That's what we're calling deaf gain these days. And that's one, de that one way that we can help the medical profession, I think. Uh, unfortunately, money talks. We all know. Very true. I don't want to get into the politics and economics of, of the deaf world, but I do think that deaf gain is exactly what Oliver Sacks was writing about in his book. When he talks about spatial orientation and how information is used and the syntax of ASL being uh, three-dimensional and you can have it in a, in a referential layout so that it's visually connected, there are many hearing children who are also highly visual, and they too are suffering because they are not being given visual uh, information in a visual manner. And we need to expose society that there is something to be learned from deaf brains, how we think, and that something then can be beneficial and brought over to the hearing world. That's why we have signing babies, but certainly that is not sufficient. We need more applications to the broader public. Well, I love deaf gain. I love that. Now, speaking of deaf gain, I want to ask Lewis about deaf heart. If you can just share with us what that means. OK, sure. Let's go back to the concept of, uh, I'm a professional interpreter. When the uh, interpreting profession was first established back in the, 60s, 99% of the interpreters had deaf parents. They grew up signing. They grew up in the deaf culture. They understood in a gut kind of way uh, what the deaf world was like, what living deaf was like. As the profession grew, there were more and more people entering the profession because the laws mandated that there were interpreting services. And there were more and more interpreters needed. Those interpreters who had grown up in the deaf world, there were not sufficient numbers of them. There were people who were learning sign language for the first time, studying sign language, getting a degree, graduating an interpreter training program or an interpreter education program. But they didn't have that gut feeling of what deaf culture was. Yes, they studied books. 
They tried to get involved in, in the deaf world, but they weren't really of it. They didn't have that gut feeling about the deaf world or the bedside man manner, even uh, to put it in doctor terms. Uh, and that can't be taught. You have to get involved in the world. It's, a, it's an ethical decision to get involved in the world that you're interpreting for. You can't just translate. I hear the words they're saying. Here are the signs they're making. You have to try to meld the two cultures of the interlocutors who you're interpreting for. And that's what I call deaf heart. That's really my definition of deaf heart. Uh, any additional comments from the panel? Well, I do think deaf heart is important. But how in the world do you teach it? I have no idea. It's hard. Often, uh, educators in the interpreting profession talk about deaf heart. And they think that new, brand new signers or brand new interpreters should be placed with children and deaf children interpreting for them. Deaf children who are mainstream, which means those deaf children are usually the only deaf person in the entire school. And unfortunately, you've got brand new signers who become the language models for these deaf children. And the children have had no previous exposure to sign language other than these interpreters. So they go to school, and somebody who has awkward signing style and non-natural communication gets sent as the interpreter in there, and that's not deaf heart. I think they should send the best interpreters to the very youngest children so that we can have good communication as a child grows up. I think it's a violation of deaf heart for the opposite to occur. And I do think in the interpreting profession, they do need to have more respect for deaf children. They need formal training. They need to have signing training programs for people who will specialize in the educational arena. Well, and it's not just the in interpreting field, it's education in general. Those who are educating the deaf children need to have deaf heart too. And not just the interpreters, but the teachers, the administrators, on all levels of education. They need to understand what it means to have access to language and to culture. What does that mean? Now, this is interesting, because when my son uh, has his education. I want to compare mine to his and also my daughter's. The process has been very interesting. I went to the deaf school and I found myself always waiting. Always waiting for all the other kids to understand. And the teacher was way too busy focusing on the deaf children who had no language skills, trying to get them at least caught up to a level playing field, but I already knew the answer, but I couldn't be called on, and I just had to wait. But I was being denied an education because I kept waiting for them. I couldn't wait any longer, and I didn't want that to happen to my son. So when I saw my son had the potential to go to the uh, school called Tripod, which is a multi-sensory school. No, it no longer exists in California, unfortunately. He then transitioned into a mainstream class in third grade. I, one way stream, not a mainstream. And he was placed with an interpreter. And the interpreter signed bizarrely. They signed very in, imagined signs that had nothing to do with reality. It certainly wasn't my five generations of sign language. This is the way I was trying to say, this is the way I sign, and the way you sign it is something so odd. So. I had a meeting with the school. I had a meeting with the IEP team. And I said, please, let me work with that interpreter. And every week, the interpreter had to read units on sign language and would ask me what particular signs for science equipment were, and signs for math, and signs for English. And I taught that interpreter and very fortunately, the interpreter had a great attitude. And I would say, that's deaf heart. Lousy, like, lousy training, but good deaf heart. <laughs> so I trained that interpreter. We met weekly. We worked together. And there was such a tremendous improvement in the way that interpreter signed. So because that interpreter then shared my communication mode, the interpreter then could share the communication mode with my son, which allowed him to improve his schooling. So he did continue on in mainstream with the same interpreter with better communication. Now my daughter, I'm happy to say, 
She goes to the California School for the Deaf in Riverside, which is one of the leading schools for bilingual ASL and English uh, pro education, and it's very friendly to all forms of communication, be they oral, auditory, etc. So my daughter, I believe, has the best educational experience so far of any of the three of us. But again, not many deaf children are like my daughter. She is uniquely fortunate because she has access to language. One possible solution would be for certified deaf interpreters, interpreters who themselves are actually deaf and have grown up with their native language, be the um, interpreters in an elementary school situation for deaf students, could really expose them to all the richness and the layers of the full language that has a culture behind it, mm. the real syntax and the real grammar, the real language. But CDIs are not well known. A certified deaf interpreter, CDI, is uh, what our national association, the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, has established for deaf individuals themselves to become interpreters. Those deaf people who have grown up actually in the culture and are not just new signers and beginners, but can actually give the full meaning of the full, all of the levels of the language. Well, I think it's not only being a language model, but a role model in the field. So they see a deaf person working in a job as a professional every day, not just like some nobody on the totem pole. Well, like Terry said, she wanted to become hearing, right? But if, we, if you would have had a CDI in the classroom, nobody would want to become hearing because you'd see a professional deaf person. Right. You would have someone that you connected with. You would feel a part of what is going on I around you. I a few things. First of all, I want to understand about the educational interpreters. Would you take someone who studies Spanish in college for two to four years and let them interpret for, and let them interpret Spanish? And then we, well, this is what no. we're talking about when we're talking about educational interpreters. We're talking about people who've gone to, you know, God bless their hearts and everything. I mean, I know that they, they mean well, but you know, that's not, you can't teach a language unless you really, really know a language. And that's a scary situation. The second thing is, Terry, I got a question for you. I think it's a very, you're in an unusual situation. And you're able to advocate for yourself. But can you imagine what it's like if you're a hearing parent of a deaf child and you're placed in a hearing school in a mainstreaming program? I think most of the time the, I, mm -hmm. I think most of the time the issues of interpreting don't even come up because they're using that caption thing. I mean, really, they're, they're, they're replacing that. They're, they're replacing interpreters with that. Now, the problem with that is, one, the people they're hiring for COD have the same problems. They're still really not the top COD people. The top COD people are in the courtroom and so forth. So you get people who really aren't even great in COD. But the second thing is, that's not really a language. And you've got kids who start school way behind, and that's how they're supposed to catch up with the hearing peers. I see that on a regular basis because the last four years I've been working with kids who have defective cochlear implants. Um, and it's a sad thing. And what has happened well, with that? Well, what's happened with this is the parents often are taught you can't use sign language with deaf kids. So when the cochlear implant goes defective, and oftentimes it's not, it's not known. Oftentimes for years, two years, I have a lot of grieving parents in my office who are very sad and feel totally guilty because the doctors and the audiologists told them, be patient, give it more time. Your kid is stubborn. Your kid is stubborn. Your kid's not trying hard enough. You're not trying hard enough. So I hear that over and over again. And then two years later, they find out, guess what? Maybe the implant never, ever worked. Yeah, and, and what those kids have lost and what we've been able to prove in court is that what those kids were deprived of is an opportunity to learn a language. And you know, guess what? If you don't learn a language, Eddie, we all know what happens. We, if you don't learn a language when you're a baby or a young child, your chances of developing a language is gone. Um, I mean, I've had the privilege of working with kids and adults, by the way, adults, who have never learned language. 
There are right now are probably five deaf persons in correctional facilities all over the country who can't be tried for the crimes they're excused of because they don't know a language. And Terry, I have a question. I have a question for you as an attorney. I'm wondering, when you talk about language deprivation, well, I actually have a few questions. First of all, is language deprivation a form of abuse? And does that deny a child's right to access language? I mean, what part of the law do we need to capitalize on in order to fight for deaf children's right to have access to language? Is it the 14th Amendment or what? We're more talking, I think, international human rights. International. international human rights, yeah. I'm going to ask if the interpreter We're can move over because I want to see what Terry is, there is saying. Really a, is there really a right in this country, other than when you're provided by a regulation or a statute to have an interpreter? I mean, if you're, if you're accused of a crime, you have a right against self-discrimination and you have a right to understand the charges against you. You're right in terms of having civil, I know you're talking about something more. But you're talking about is there a right to a language? I can make a strong argument against that it's a form of abuse to deprive a deaf child of the opportunity to learn a language. But then is, is there really a right to a language? It's harder. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I wish I could with an easy question, and I wish I could say something better. And as a lawyer, as a lawyer who's been a lawyer for 25 years, this has been the most frustrating thing. I've had, I've had so many people deprived. I've, had, I've offered to go to New Jersey and volunteer to interpret for deaf, deaf Russians. And the court says, no, they don't have a right to an interpreter. I've had problems. I've been in the court where people have looked at me and said, you're a deaf attorney, you don't have a right to an interpreter. So then what happens? Well, I was, well what about um, me? I, like I had a choice. I had an awful choice that day. I, I, my clinic was actually an interpreter. And I had a choice. I could be stubborn and say, all right, we're not going to have court today because I need an interpreter to do my job here. Or I could have let my clinic interpret for me. And I landed up, I was a young, I was a young, I was a young, and I didn't impossible. want my clients to spend the day in jail. <laughs> so I think that we should turn the tables and tell hearing people, you don't have a right to speak. You, don't, you can't use your language, no, no English for you. Wouldn't that be equal? See, I think that we need to we would try visual power then. Visual language only. Imagine what that would do to hearing babies. <laughs> and what we're talking about is something more important, something that's very, very beautiful. We're talking about the right to be human and the human condition. And I can't remember exactly who said this, but one of the quotes that I've taken all my life I'm is the about quote that civil a rights? society is measured by how good you treat your weakest member. And not that I'm saying deaf is weak, that's the thing that I fight with. I mean, that's the, same, the thing that I fight with. People come to me and say, well, aren't you so lucky? Aren't you, you're so wonderful, you can speak. And I look at them and say, you know, I look at them and I say, do you know what? I don't say it in a four letter word, but I say, excuse me, do you know you are insulting me when you say that to me? Because it's an insult. I should not be measured by my ability to speak. I should be measured by who I am. I should be measured by my ability to participate in a group. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I will say this is a great discussion. It appears we still have time. Do you want us to more answer more questions? Yes. We have about 10 more minutes to have more discussion, and we'll open it up to the audience. 
Uh, yeah, I would love to open it up to the audience. Yeah, let's, let's get started. Let's, let's get them involved. Up. Let's do that. <laughs> and can we turn the house lights up, please? Deaf culture. A woman in the second row. We're asking her to stand up. I'm Melanie Chaitu, and I have a question for Teresa Curtin. We're talking about international human rights, and of course, in the United States, we are supposed to support human rights, but whether or not that's accurate is something else. Um, so I'm wondering, what do we endorse human rights 100% in the United States? That's. Uh, do we guarantee human rights in the United States? Do we guarantee? Do we guarantee? Well, that's, you, of course, the answer to that is. <laughs> because I just don't understand that. Because we're supposed to treat pe people equally as citizens, and we're supposed to practice that. We pledge allegiance to the flag, we learn this in school, but it doesn't seem applicable in the real world, and we're, see we're noticing that in what you've been discussing about what happens in the country today. Yeah. And so I don't really understand why this is all so complicated. There seem to be tons of internal contradictions. Do you know what is I think it's enormous. I don't Autism. think people don't understand, despite all of the facts wonderful book, despite everything about deaf culture, People don't understand, people don't see the value of having a deaf culture. Uh, that is autism. Mm. Autism, pure and simple. We are discriminated against <laughs> on the basis of, basis of not being able to hear, on the basis of our audit, uh, auditory abilities. But that's the word for many hearing people, autism. A simple definition really is uh, how do you value people or do you value people only on the basis of their ability to hear? Is that the basis of their self-worth? That's autism. But to give you an example, even in the interpreting field, we have a national conference where interpreters get together, 2,000 interpreters from all over the country. They're mixing, there are many deaf pe people, they're socializing and mixing together. Uh, they're mostly hearing interpreters. And when they're out in the hallway, 90% of them are talking to each other and leaving the deaf people who are also in the ha hallways out. That's autism. Uh, if people can sign, they should sign if there if they're deaf people around. That's, uh, that's a, a, a way to avoid autism. Uh, do we have other questions in the house? I think I'm going to point to you back there. So, not personally. Oh, sorry. The interpreter. Wait, wait. The interpreter's behind. So, <laughs> we're asking her to repeat the question. Have you ever thought about establishing a law, a law that would require children, both deaf and hearing, to have access to language in a variety of means, not just auditory English, but also signing visual language? Well, uh, I have it personally, but I think the UN does have one time had a task force that was working on that issue. Uh, and they still are. Because one of the things that's wonderful about being a person of linguistic minorities, deaf is deaf culture, deaf and deaf people have the same problem, and in some ways we have more legal protection than other non-English speaking languages. And so, again, it's a question of how much as a society and a culture we value the fact that different people speak different languages. Um, does that make sense? Well, and I don't know exactly the name of it, but there is a, a UN instrument, oh, yeah. uh, COPD, CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, yes. Which a failed. human rights instrument. It didn't instrument. pass our Senate. Yes, it didn't pass our Senate, but it is an international legal instrument. Has been ratified by many governments 
around the world. Each nation will decide whether they're going to sign and ratify. But then it becomes a, a legal international instrument that can be used to enforce the laws. Uh, of course, it hasn't been ratified by our United States Senate. Uh, Iraq, Iran, China, and the, US. and the US have failed to ratify this legal instrument. Uh, we can't even pass that in this country. So you're asking for a legal right to language in this country? No. Right, and then we say that we're leaders in human rights in this country. I mean, that's a joke. Hi, I wanted to thank you all for being here. It was very interesting. I wanted to share about my father who grew up deaf, and when he was growing up, his parents were not encouraged to sign to him. And I think later he had something called the Rochester Method where, where, he, was o where he would only fingerspell every word and but but what happened was he eventually he eventually learned sign at some point and he ended up I feel having a great life he retired from Kodak and 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 w when I when I think about his life I I I'm very proud of him of of everything he's done and I guess w what I wanted to ask is how much would his life maybe have been different had he grown up with signing? Would it, would it have uh, changed his life tremendously? I'm just curious about that. Well, I, I... Well, I'd say the question is, do we have high unemployment of deaf people where they have no ability to get jobs because of low literacy? And the reason for the low literacy comes back to no access for language. And the reason for no access to language is because they're mandated to learn speech first. They assume that they'll learn speech first and be introduced to language later. So we get many deaf people. And your father, who tried to develop himself, we do have deaf people like Teresa and, and, and people like your father who do succeed. And, uh, Teresa went to prestigious school and she had no interpreters and she took had people take notes and then she got a cochlear implant, she speaks, and everybody thinks, hey, that's great. But can all deaf children succeed the way Teresa did? No. There are a great many who fall through the cracks. And they're depressed, they may get into drugs, uh, they have high unemployment rates. They rely on government subsidies. And so it's a quality of life issue. And that's the, the point that isn't fair, that we want to give children both languages and allow them to make lives for themselves. And so at least we give them access to language, and then they can make the choices. They have the right to create their what turns into being quality of life for them, and well, that's what I'm talking we're about. We're empowering them. They should be empowered to make decisions for themselves. Empower them to make his or her own life choices. We each have our own divine path to choose whether it's right or wrong. We have that choice. But maybe your father wasn't given the opportunity to make that choice for himself. But it's not a choice if you don't even have access. If you don't have access right. to your education, right. then how do you make that choice? How do you make a life for yourself? I, I, any more questions? People with their hands there up? There are a lot of people waving their hands up there. This gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. I can't hear. I don't know ASL. I work in a public high school teaching hearing students. Uh, my employers are totally ignorant as to understanding what I go through. How do we get them to be more aware, sensitive, what suggestions do you have that I can give my stupid employers? <laughs> we just need to open our hearts. 
Well, and we have to speak up, so to speak. And we hope that this panel is recorded so that this discussion can be shared with your employers <laughs> and that they need to hear from deaf people like you, like me, like the rest of us. Did you want to say something in addition? No, I just wanted to say, should we require hearing people to take Russian in sensitivity? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I do think that the power is in the media for awareness. So this New York Live Arts event, NYLA, you have no idea what you're doing for our community by holding this event. I and want we to do thank, thank you for that. You. Thank you, Live Arts. Yes, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you for creating the idea, f the concept for this panel because we need to promote awareness and we also need to capitalize on the power of the media. My name is Lorraine, and I have greatly enjoyed this panel. And I was uh, wondering, you talked about your Claire, Claire's Children Foundation, and I'm wondering, how will you be in touch with the medical profession, do outreach to parents? How will you get them to know about your foundation? Well, Claire's Children is not a, f a foundation. That was an incorrect interpretation. It's a business. Our target is an e-learning website for early language access. And what we want to do is to develop a relationship with hospitals, with newborn screening for hearing. We want to have a newborn language screening concomitant with that in alignment with the hearing detection system. I'm not trying to buck the system. There are some things uh, that are beneficial about finding deaf babies. Absolutely, newborn hearing screening is a very cool thing. But then what happens after that? That's problematic. So we're good at finding deaf babies, and then all of a sudden we go off on the track of uh, audio treatment, solely medicalizing these deaf kids, but there's no visual exposure visual access to visual language. I am hoping that we will be able to work with those newborn hearing detection screenings. I'm hoping that we can develop uh, alignments, alliances with hospitals so that it will be a, a, a service that provides emotional support for parents as well because they're grieving when they discover that their child is deaf, and that's going to be the first person they've ever met in their entire life, and that's not their fault. They just didn't know about this world. So that's how we're going to target people. Thank you for asking me. Quick question, Quick question if I may, <laughs> from a, a, a hearing person. <laughs> um, <laughs> since I have the microphone. Um, <laughs> 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 I, uh, I read Seeing Voices, uh, actually it was probably the first uh, uh, Saxian uh, book that I had the pleasure of reading um, to prepare myself <laughs> for this festival. Um, and uh, deeply moved by the work and the stories in the, in the work. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, are we, I, well, I guess I may be able to answer my own question, but what do we do for individuals in, uh, you know, impoverished communities who don't have uh, access to, you know, the best schools that say, like Terry Lynn's children are able to attend, or uh, what what measures are being taken to support those who are less privileged in this country, but also in other parts of the world? Are there any? systems in place for that? Well, I think the deaf community is the rich resource of information about the deaf. And to inform the powers that be, uh, it's not based on research and academics and professionals alone. We, we the deaf community, we live the experience every day. We know what it means to be deaf. We know where the good, good deaf schools are. We know where resources are. 
to achieve equality. We know where the language-rich environments are. And I think there is an economic power. When you think about the deaf community, it doesn't have a great deal of economic power because we, again, we have a high unemployment rate and we are not necessarily equipped to compete financially with the others. So it's like when in former times African Americans were oppressed, but then they started to use the media. That's key. And then they had the Spike Lee films back then and the NAACP. And we saw people promoting each other as having the tools, the power, and the acumen to be able to get their message out and compete until the awareness became so great that society actually changed and became more tolerant and said, no, there should not be separate rights for people. It should be equal rights regardless of color. But Claire's children, for example, I'm actually in my final stage of developing it. I don't have finances to complete it. I can't find rich deaf people anywhere. Don't know where they are. Are they here? Where, where are my, where's my economic power? So that's an issue. If I find somebody who could possibly fund me, but they're a hearing person and they're rich and they don't understand what, why we would even need this for, why we even need this, because cochlear implants are so widely known. And that is a challenge. And I do think that we're talking about economic power, which is a huge issue for us in the deaf community. Well, for me, it's, it's a threefold issue. Communication, sharing both languages between the majority culture and the minority deaf culture, asking us what is best for us. We do know what is best for us. We know what we need. We know what we want. We want to be partnered with the majority culture. Secondly, secondly, secondly is the partnership. It's not just us on our own. You help us, we'll help you, mm -hmm. we provide mutual support, we are partners. And thirdly, a willingness to learn and to adapt. That's, that's really crucial. Those three aspects are Beautiful. extremely crucial. Right. You know, I'm sure, based on what you just said, people are gonna be coming up to me when this is over and they're gonna be saying, look, the deaf community <laughs> doesn't change. You know, you guys, you, you guys think you know everything. You know, you're perfect. And you're not willing to move. You're not willing to change. And it, I mean, for me, I've always been stuck totally in the middle between the hearing people who don't understand. They don't understand it. They don't understand. They don't get when we say that we know what you just used. You said, you used the term, we know best. You say that to a hearing person, they're going to say, oh, no, how do you know what's best for my child? Look, you got the high deaf unemployment rate. My kid is never going to learn. My kid is never going to do anything if it stays in the community. I'm doing the best thing I can. So there's, so there's one point. We've got to somehow moderate that a little bit somehow. But the second thing is education is so important. I mean, I'm dealing on a not a, on a regular basis with a situation where people just don't have a language because they never had the educational opportunity to learn a language. And I'm really worried about that now because really, I, if anything, I think the situation, the educational situation, is a lot worse than it was when Dr. Sachs wrote his books. The deaf institutions have been closed. The deaf kids are mainstreamed everywhere. And then I want to know what percentage, one, 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 one. And they're one, isolated. And they're in a special ed schools. Yeah. And our time <laughs> is running down. The sand is running out. So I do want to say thank you so much for this very exciting discussion. Oh. Just one more. One more question? Thank you all. I just wanted to know when each of you first read Oliver's book, Seeing Voices, and what impact it had on you personally. Do you want me to go? Well, for me, I read the book, um, well, it's been a long time, uh, in 89 or 90 when it was first published. 
And I was most impressed with, I, I mean, I understand that Oliver is a, uh, a thinker and a scientist and uh, he has a point of view that's scientific and uh, language acquisition and, uh, and yet he opened his mind to more than that. It was culture, it was the richness uh, of the history, uh, art, everything that has to do with the deaf world uh, that was more than just a scientist. That was what impressed me the most about the book, and that's why I thank you, Oliver, for that. Hearing people will listen to other hearing people, and they say, oh, Oliver said that, then maybe they will open their minds a little bit more, too. Thank you for that. And as for me, Well, I was pretty young when it was first came out. Okay, I was about 18, 19 years old. And that's when I read the book. And for me, I was saying, wow, look at this. It was just overwhelming to me. And it was so intense. And I had to repeatedly read it until I understood what was coming through. And at that point, I knew how important the book was. And I reread it. And now I think, yes, of course, it's easy for me to read now. But I think that some people are standing alone in the street, preaching their Bible, proselytizing in the middle of the highways, and nobody's listening. You know that, that feeling? But I feel that way about this book, Seeing Voices. So I feel like I'm standing up and, and saying, read the book, 1989, 2013. <laughs> what, how much time does it take for change to happen? And it does make me angry. So Oliver, your book made me angry. <laughs> and that's good, because anger starts movement. And movement is what we need. It's time for us to move. We've got to assume responsibility. And I want to thank Oliver Sacks for outlining it so clearly. You also taught me to hope. Because you didn't sign. You had no awareness of deafness and the deaf community. And yet you understood it in a profound way. So that gave me hope that if you could understand it, that means the hearing society is capable of understanding. Um, I read the book about uh, two days ago. I got it on Monday. <laughs> so I had it with me on the airplane. I've been um, sort of, um, it's been a page turner for me this week. So I'm a bit younger than the other panelists, sorry to say, but it, I, I did relate to the book. It gave me pride. I knew the history, but the way that you explain it made me think, that's me, that's my history. You're sharing my history with the world. And thank you for that. I couldn't have said it any better. You expressed it clearly, and you have taught them what we are about about my history, about my culture, about my language, and that it works. That the brain is able to create language and that language is innate with culture. And I could, you know, talk all day until I'm blue in the face trying to explain that and never get through to anyone. But the way that you explained it just seems to hit the target as it is. It's amazing. I'm so grateful that you took the time and the years of your life and that you were willing to accept the challenge of learning about us to be able to share it with the world. Thank you. Uh, well, I've always said that if I win motto, the first thing I would do is I would have your book given out to every parent who finds out their child is born deaf in a hospital. I really would. And it's an amazing book. And what I also love about your book is that you have respect for the people who came before you when you learn from them. And for me, because we have such a wonderful, rich tradition and history, and you just, you took that history and you expressed it in a different, maybe clearer way in some ways, but you built on what was already there and respected that. And I'm hoarding you for that. 
The, uh, the next thing is, I re if you had one more project to devote your life to, <laughs> what I, and I hope you have, I hope you have to develop your life to 10,000 more projects, I would like you to expand that book and go back and rewrite it. Really, we need someone in this life, this world right now, who could take a look at the cochlear implants and the medicalization of deafness and evaluate that at different eyes. Uh, and I would love it. So thank you. We felt we're honored to be here. And Bill Chee Jones, you're amazing for letting giving us this opportunity. Yes. Because time is now. <laughs> I want to thank our distinguished panelists. You make me proud to be in the deaf community. Thank you for your thoughts and convictions. And again, thank you to our interpreters. Thank you, New York Live Arts, Bill T. Jones, Kim Wild, Corey Rushton, Jenny, Michael, and Veronica. And thank you most of all, Oliver. Thank you for your compassionate work as a physician, your undying curiosity, your delight in discovery, and the dialogue that ensues from that research. Your research captivates us, and your authentic telling of the stories of the people you meet, and how you write those stories, and all of those wonderful footnotes, <laughs> makes us better in understanding people and places we've never been, and maybe understand ourselves better. Thank you. Thank you.